So thank you again, everybody, so much for joining us for our virtual program, Always Be Curious. My name is Sarah Kiefer, again, and I'm the local history librarian at the Ridgewood Public Library. My colleague, Larissa Brooks, is also on this presentation, and you might know her from all the sustainability series programs that we do at the library. Hello, everybody. It's Larissa. Hi, Larissa. We're happy to have you all join us tonight and hope you'll check our website for all the wide ranging programs that we offer throughout the library. And also please note we are open to the public so feel free to stop by to browse study research and ask any questions, though, if there are questions about bees, I do recommend you ask Frank instead of me. <laughs> Our speaker tonight is Frank Mortimer and he'll take questions at the end, please use the uh, chat feature for those. And also, if you're interested in purchasing his book, especially a signed copy, uh, if you go to Bookends in Ridgewood, and we can put up the website information later on, uh, feel free to stop by, pick up his book, Be People and the Bugs They Love. This book introduces a swarm of offbeat characters, and charting his path from hobbyist to master beekeeper, Frank, aka Frank the Bee, uh, the bee Man, introduces us to buzzy and quirky characters who make up today's beekeepers. You may have uh, run into Frank about out and about in Ridgewood and the surrounding areas promoting his favorite bees. And you might even have caught a glimpse of his bee helpers, his wife, son, and two little girls. When not excited to talk about bees, you can always catch Frank in a literary conversation, especially today. If you happen to know what literary day it is, Frank will be your next new favorite book buddy. <laughs> Without further ado, I'd like uh, to turn it over to Frank. Thank, thank you, Sarah. And I'd like to thank uh, the Ridgewood Library for setting this up. And I'd also like to thank Bookends. It's because of the local support that we have from independent bookstores like Bookends um, that we can do programs like this. So I would please encourage you to buy books, you know, not mine, but any books from Bookends so that uh, the library can continue to put on wonderful programs like this. So thanks to everybody for coming and uh, I'll go ahead and get started. And if any uh, B questions buzz through your head as I'm talking, please also, you can put that in the chat and then we can uh, read those at the end. Um, so I'm gonna give a, a quick little thing about uh, how I went from being interested in bees to master beekeeper to writing this book. So I always start all my talks with that there's two things I always want people to remember about honeybees. The first is that honeybees and yellow jackets are not the same. They're as similar as domestic dogs and hyenas. The way to tell them the, di the difference between them is that honeybees are fuzzy and yellow jackets look like they're made of plastic, so they're smooth. So the real way to remember it is that fuzzy is good and plastic is bad. And then the yellow jackets, those are the ones that generally sting people because their um, stingers are like a syringe and they're straight, while a honeybee's stinger is barbed like a fish hook. So they actually lodge inside you and then the bee will pull itself apart um, and die when it stings you. The other fact is that one third of all the food we eat <clears throat> is thanks to the honeybees. So especially all the tasty stuff that's blooming right now, from apples to strawberries and blueberries in our area, as well as oranges and uh, watermelons and almonds are all due to pollination. And what I think is interesting about this is that all of these foods are not native to North America and the honeybee is also not native to North America. So when the European colonists came over and they brought some of their favorite foods, they also brought the honeybees over to pollinate them. So how did I get into beekeeping? Well, I went to a lecture at a library, which is why I love doing these talks now um, at, at libraries. And uh, the talk was, uh, was on our neighbor. It was in the Waldwick Library, actually. And um, the talk was on honeybees. And when I was there, I, the number one thing that I learned was that there is a local beekeeping club in New Jersey. And up to this point, I had never had bees. I'd never knew anybody that had bees. I was never around a beehive, but my entire life, there was just something inside of me that said, Hey, it'd be fun to be around stinging insects. So I, I go to this uh, lecture. I learn about the club 
And um, what surprised me the most is that here, I mean, you think about where we live and, you know, I didn't know anybody else was interested in bees. And then I walk into this room and it's packed full of other people. And then I find out about the club and I was surprised that there's a club in Northeast New Jersey and that there's enough people that can sustain the club and keep it going. But by going to that is how I started my journey. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to read little snippets here and there from you from my book. And uh, this is how I got my first bees. Instead of being part of installing my first hive in my backyard, my official start to beekeeping came via a series of text messages from Sarah, my son's babysitter. Days before when I told Sarah that I was going to become a beekeeper and start keeping bees in the backyard, I got the look. Something I would see time and time again when I told someone about my new hobby. The look is the facial expression that regardless of one's native language, is understood to mean, are you effing kidding me? Sarah was overly dramatic about everything from breakfast foods to coordinating her outfits with my son's crayon selections. So my news about getting bees really sent her over the edge. As I sat on a train somewhere outside of Secaucus, the text from Sarah went something like this. There's a bright yellow car in the driveway and two strange men in the backyard. Oh, those must be the guys from the bee club bringing me my bees. Eek! Are all the windows closed? Can bees fly down the chimney? Ack! What should I do? Relax. You have nothing to worry about. Nothing bad is going to happen. Uh, now there's a huge cloud of smoke in the backyard. They're burning down the yard. No, they lit their smoker. You use smoke to keep bees calm. Hmm, what kind of smoke makes bees mellow? What are they burning in there? Probably pine needles. Oh, now they're carrying a box with a shiny silver top through the backyard. The fat guy's yelling at the old guy saying he's using too much smoke. The old guy's telling him to relax and he's puffing even more smoke at him. The old guy just pulled a screen off the box and he's puffing even more smoke. The fat guy's dancing around slapping himself. He's yelling about waiting till he wasn't standing in front of the hive. Now the fat guy's running through the backyard screaming, I'm hit, I'm hit, got my ear, got my ear. The old guy is laughing. Now they're both leaving the backyard. Someone's ringing the front doorbell. It's them. They told me to tell you that the beehive is in and they're leaving. I can see the stinger hanging from the fat guy's ear. Ooh. At about the same time Sarah was hyperventilating on the living room floor, I received a single text messages. Bees are in your backyard. It was a piece of cake. Everything went smoothly. Good luck. At last, I had a hive in my backyard, and it made me smile. It was something I wanted for so long, and now I could finally call myself a beekeeper. And then, so that was my start. But then after a few years, I was actually elected president of the bee club, and I had um, lots of ideas of how I wanted to improve it. But to improve the club, I needed money, and I needed for the club, and I also needed more members to show up, because at the time, um, we only had a few hundred dollars in the treasury and we had about 12 people coming to the meetings. So I was thinking, how can I do this? And the answer was B talks and sort of what I'm doing here, but uh, also as I've done throughout the area that I started doing B talks as a way to raise money for the club. And the, other, the advantage of talking about bees to different, different groups is that it raised awareness about, about the club but also just to the general public about what they can do uh, uh, for the bees and how bees are beneficial to have around. And the thing is that with every talk that I did, my talks were getting better because anytime that somebody asked me a question that I didn't know, I had to research it. And then, so I researched it. So I was more prepared the next time. And then just by saying things over and over again, I could refine my explanations. And so when people got it, I would use it again. If they didn't quite get it, I'd keep working on it until it, it became clear. And so by doing all those talks, it wanted increased my knowledge about beekeeping, but also that kind of became the foundation for my book because I had all this practice of just how do you say it so people can understand it. And then from those talks, I just translated it to the book. And there's a beekeeping joke that's actually true. If you ask three beekeepers a question, you're going to get four answers. There's all these differing opinions. And from that, there's a lot of bad advice. And um, what I realized after years of being president of the club is that 
too many people were viewing it as opinion versus opinion as opposed to opinion versus fact. So I realized that I needed to do something. And what I needed was to sign up for the Cornell Master Beekeeping Program. And a funny story with this is I can tell you the exact day that I signed up because it was February 8th, 2017. And I know that because that's the day my youngest daughter was born. And I literally signed up for the course in Valley Hospital as my wife was in labor. And it was early labor. Um, and so I, I say it's uh, from the euphoria of the early labor that my wife was you know, willing to say, oh yeah, sure, go ahead. Because when I said, hey, uh, you know, today's the first day that that program opens up and I was afraid that, um, that if I didn't sign up quickly that I would lose my spot. And uh, so my wife was like, yeah, sure, go ahead. So while to the non-beekeeper that might sound weird, but to most beekeepers, um, signing up for a bee class in the hospital while your wife's in labor is perfectly normal. <laughs> and uh, for those that don't know what a master beekeeper is, I am going to share with you the true secret. It's being able to drink coffee through your bee veil. Seriously, it's, uh, the program is four courses over 15 months, and each of the courses focuses on a different area of biology um, or science having to do with keeping bees. And then at the end of each of these courses, you had a final project that you had to do. And uh, the, the, the final project for the first course was you had to write an outline for giving a speech to non-beekeepers. And like I said, I had now done by this time over 125 public talks. And so, bam, it was super easy for me to write. And that one assignment is what became a light bulb for me and really made me change my direction of my life. Um, because I took that outline and I had gotten a lot of good feedback uh, from it from my professor. And so I decided to take that outline and I turned it into an article for the, the main beekeeping magazine. And yes, if you didn't know it, there are actually two different monthly magazines specifically for keeping bees. So the one that I wrote for was Bee Culture. Uh, I sent it in and the editor said, there's a lot of good information in here. And so he published it. And I was so excited by that. I decided to write two more articles and then those also got published. So I went from never submitting anything to getting three magazine articles published in less than a year. And more than getting things published, what I really liked is how many people were reaching out to tell me that they liked my stories. Uh, so I kept writing them um, for Bee Culture and for, for other places as well. And I kept getting more positive feedback. And that's when I decided to write my biggest and best story, which is my book, Bee People and the Bugs They Love. So what are people saying? Well, the first quote by um, that I'm, I'm very happy and still honored that he did this is a uh, fellow Ridgewood resident, Harlan Coben, um, who right now, Win is his uh, book that is at the top of the New York Times bestselling list. And uh, Harlan, uh, I was honored to have him uh, read my manuscript and provide this quote. And uh, what I love best about it is that it's all dad jokes. So it's right in my wheelhouse. And he said, be people in the bugs they love. It's the bee's knees and getting a ton of buzz. Be smart people and read this unbelievably interesting look at the quirky world of beekeeping. And last summer, the New York Times also reviewed it and they said it is an achievement to convey so much knowledge so accessibly without seeming overbearing. Mortimer intersperses facts about his passion in a successful and funny book that is sure to swell the ranks of the world's beekeepers. And then out in San Francisco, the book review, the reviewer actually said, this ranks among the best written books I've ever reviewed. This book includes great humor and a use of allegory that reveals tremendous background knowledge. Bee people are a weird and fascinating lot, and the author delves deeply enough into their eccentricities to make it for a fascinating read. And so what about my book? What makes it so special? And the thing that I, I like to be clear, it's not a how-to book. This is, this is not a, hey, I want to start keeping bees, so I want to very specific book that tells me what to do. This is a laugh at my mistakes book. And um, it has a series of stories in it that, uh, and, I, and I, I'm a firm believer in that people can learn from their mistakes. And some of my mistakes were so big that I believe that an entire world of beekeeping can learn from it. So one of my favorite mistakes that I like to, um, to tell people, I'll read for you real fast. 
most of my monumental mistakes usually began with me saying, let me just do this real fast. Whenever I think I'll just move at a faster speed or that I'll get something done zippity quick is when the bees remind me why it's always better for me to take my time and never ever rush. The first time my soon-to-be wife experienced her first bee sting was when I said, I need to feed one of my hives. I'll be quick. Let me just do this real fast. Then, because I was focused on working fast instead of watching what I was doing, I made a series of mistakes that led to my surprise that she still married me, soon-to-be wife, getting stung on her right thigh. Since I was going to be moving fast, I thought I'd skip lighting the smoker, which led to alarm pheromones getting released and putting the bees on high alert. Next, I haphazardly laid the inner cover, which was covered in a fair number of bees, against the side of the hive. And when I went to pour the syrup into the hive top feeder, I bumped into the inner cover, causing it to topple over and land on my never screamed, but couldn't believe what I had done, surprised that she still married me, soon to be wife's feet. Once the inner cover hit the ground, the bees became airborne. And the one that landed on my bride's thigh decided that she had had enough. Thankfully, once my so much smarter than me, never screamed, but couldn't believe what I had done, surprised that she still married me, soon to be wife realized that she had been stung. She immediately walked away from the hives, went back to the car and waited until I was done. Now, whenever she accompanies me to the hive, the first thing she says is, did you light your smoker? <laughs> And see, it's, it's more than just a book about the honeybee. It's a book that focuses on the people, the people who willingly choose to hang around with stinging insects. And it isn't an interesting lot, those of us that do keep bees, but we do connect. And so that's what there's a lot of stories about all the different people that I have met and connected with in my journey. So what kind of person is it that keeps bees? <clears throat> Probably the most important listing in the newsletter was the information about the upcoming state beekeeping meeting. As soon as I saw it, I sent in my registration and a check for $25. The meeting was being held about two hours away, closer to the Philadelphia suburbs than to New York. Even though the state of New Jersey may not be that geographically big a state, it is quite diverse and it can be divided into four mindsets. New York suburbs, Philadelphia suburbs, farmland, and down the shore, which is anywhere on Jersey's 100 plus miles of beach. If you're not from Jersey, most of your information about it has probably come from one of the reality TV shows that was filmed within its borders, which ca captured some local stereotypes, but is far from what it's really like to live here. What surprises most people about New Jersey is that it really is the garden state as it has 9,000 farms covering 720,000 acres and its biggest crops are blueberries, cranberries, and tomatoes. New Jersey has everything from a pygmy pine forest to the Appalachian Trail to the second largest waterfall east of the Mississippi River. And no matter where they live, most New Jerseyans love all the natural settings that their state has to offer. I arrived at the meeting bright and early so I would be in line for the 7.30 a.m. check-in. The meeting was being held at the Rutgers University Eco Complex, which is on a Rutgers satellite campus in Bordertown, New Jersey, and focuses on the environment and agriculture. Everyone that I met was super friendly, and it was easy to see that most of the people had known one another for years. I didn't see anyone from our club, so I grabbed a coffee and a bagel and just walked around the atrium before heading into the meeting room. Within 30 minutes, the auditorium was full and every one of the 150 seats was taken. I was amazed to think that all these people had woken up at the crack of dawn on a Saturday morning just to listen to someone talk about bees. I had found my tribe. I looked around the room and thought of the children's book, Go Dog Go, only instead of big dogs, little dogs, red dogs, blue dogs, all at the dog party, this was tall beekeepers, short beekeepers, male beekeepers, female beekeepers, fat beekeepers, skinny beekeepers, old beekeepers, young beekeepers, all at the bee me team. There was just as many women as men and just as many couples as singles. The more I scanned the room, the more I realized there was not one type of person who kept bees. Beekeepers come in all sizes, shapes, genders, colors, and ages. The only thing anyone seemed to have in common was that they kept bees. And it's really true. And that's one of the things that I've, I've liked through the years is just how many different 
types of people that you've met. And um, like in the book, I talk about when I've gone to Sweden and I, you know, I did what most people do when they go to Europe. I, I found a bunch of strangers in a beekeeping club there that I've never met and hung out with them for a little bit. <laughs> but uh, the beekeepers I've met have always made great friends. And uh, it, they're, I mean, as I told the story about being in the, in the delivery in the, in the hospital when my wife was delivering the baby, beekeepers talk about bees all the time on holidays, nights, days, weekends, you name it, beekeepers are going to do it. And I, and the thing though, that I like more than just talking about bees is that the beekeepers I've met have made such great friends. And, and I think a big part of that is that if you think about what it's like to keep bees, you're nurturing a, a colony of stinging insects. It's not like a dog or a, that's going to show you affection or a cat, which may or may not show you affection. You're not going to get that from bees. So you have to, there's something inside of you that still wants to see this part of nature thrive. And, um, and I think that, that having that gene of nurturing is part of why beekeepers become great friends. These are two of my uh, favorite jokes about how bees are different from other pets. The one on the left uh, says he likes to bring them in for the winter. And then the, the New Yorker cartoon is, oh, but it's fine for you to grade papers. And because beekeepers have this nurturing gene is uh, why I think it's great for families to do it. Um, this is my, my, uh, my kids and, uh, cause my whole family, uh, helps me with the beekeeping. So it's my son and my two daughters and, uh, they have all been around bees since, uh, they were very young, like three years old. And, uh, beekeeping is really something that defines my entire family. It's something that we do together. I say, you know, some, some families might have, uh, you know, a membership to, to or sh go out back to shoot hoops or to a membership to play golf or whatever. What we do is we do bees. So we either go to the hives or we're bottling honey or extracting the honey, but it's, it's really what keeps us close and something that we can always do together. And that's why I'm proud to call myself bee people because of how much I love my bee people. Thank you so much. And uh, now we can open it up to questions. Larissa, are you able to read the questions to me, if there are any? Or do we want to open up on mute, or how is this going to work? Um, this is Sarah. I can read. And if anybody has any questions you want to send into the chat, we'll uh, make sure to ask Frank. So any questions about bees, the book, uh, Bloomsday? <laughs> And uh, since we are in Ridgewood, I'd like to say that uh, Ridgewood is a very bee-friendly community, that we were the first bee city USA in New Jersey and actually in the Northeast. And um, there are multiple beekeepers throughout our community. Well, Frank, can I, I have a quick, I have a question. I, I guess it's not a quick one. We don't want to rush through anything here. <laughs> but um, I was wondering when uh, the, the hobbling what is it the waggling dance the wag waggling waggle dance? the waggle dance yeah waggle dance now can bees how do they know another bee is doing a dance how do they sense i mean they have these five eyes but can they do they see it i mean because we're observing them from up above good question so the so to back up what what the waggle dance is is that bees communicate with two different ways they either communicate through smells uh, but they don't have noses they have antennas or they communicate through a dance called the waggle dance. And the waggle dance is how a forager bee will give directions to a food source to her fellow foragers. And on the entire planet, there's only two creatures that can give directions to, to food sources, and that's bees and people. And so when the, the, the forager does the dance, um, what they're doing is that bees have like a built-in GPS system and so they assume was they're doing this dance that the sun is at 12 o'clock and then whatever angle the food source is from if the sun were at 12 o'clock, they'll actually waggle their body and it's like they shake it. So if it's like a 45 degree angle to the left that the bee on the honeycomb will actually make that shake. 
And then if the food source is more than a football field away, the dance will be in a figure eight. And if it's closer than a football field, then they'll do a dance in a circle. Um, I do, if you go to my website, frankthebeeman.com under the B movies, I do have a waggle dance there. So to answer your question, I provided the background is that um, they do this dance inside the hive and inside a hive is always pitch black. So they're actually doing the dance on the comb. And because the comb is wax, that they can, that they can feel the vibration of the dance. And then the other foragers will kind of gather around as the bees doing it. So it's, it's even more amazing to think that they're doing it in complete darkness and they're able to give these directions that could be over three miles away and be accurate within one meter. That's pretty, I, I, I really, I mean, I, th I thought I appreciated bees before, but now I really am, it's it's a they're a really a marvel um and actually somebody has asked um if you could say more about how important it is to save the bees yeah so it's a, um there's a quote that is attributed but not probably never said by einstein that if the bees disappear the human race will in four years um i i, I don't think it's that drastic but if if you think of all the tasty fruits and vegetables that we eat that um, relate to bees, if they go away, then our diets are gonna change dramatically because then we would only be able to eat wind pollinated uh, foods. So it would be like a lot of grains or, um, <laughs> or like potatoes and things like that. But um, in addition to the food that we consume, they also pollinate a lot of food that we feed to our food. So it also would impact um, the whole food chain as well. Um, and that's, that's why bees are so important. And then here, you know, in suburbia that, you know, bees are primarily pollinating trees um, as well as other plants in your yard. So it would also deteriorate how nice your yard looks if, if bees went away. And since I mentioned about that uh, honeybees pollinate trees, I like to say, talk about that for a second, is that um, when you think of honey, that it takes in its lifetime, one bee will only make one twelfth of one teaspoon of honey. So that means it takes 12 bees lifetime work every time you sweeten a cup of tea. And so that means it takes just under 1200 bees to make a pound of honey. And um, to make that one pound of honey, those bees will had to visit uh, 2 million flowers. And to visit those 2 million flowers, the bees had to fly 56,000 miles, which is twice around the equator. And they have, and that's for one pound. And bees to get through the winter where we live have to make at least 80 pounds of honey for themselves. And that's before I would take any honey off. So it's just amazing the, the amount of numbers that come into play when you start talking about bees. And when they have the pollen in those saddlebags, that's, I mean, my gosh, they are just little, two little like uh, pom-poms, tiny pom-poms on their bodies. Um, yeah, they, I mean, can they just mix any kind of pollen? Is it just like, they don't have to just go to like clovers or um, just specifically like, or cosmos or something like that, like specific flowers? Yeah, so bee, bees are monofloritic. So if something is in bloom, they stay on it. And it's all, it's interesting to me when you think about how flowers and bees evolve together. And so it benefits the flower if bees stay on one type of flower because you know it, it, pollination is reproduction. And so if you're a clover flower, that avocado pollen isn't gonna do you any good. You need clover pollen to, to, to procreate, if you will. So um, it's interesting that bees will stay on that. And that's why like, you know, bees, they're, it's amazing of how they work so that they can ut utilize the resources that they have, the number of bees and how they allocate that to what's in bloom. And what's interesting is that like, if you think about it, like if you have back to the waggle dance, you have a several different foragers telling different places to go, then the colony has to decide, well, what percentage of bees should go to which food source. 
And so one of the top bee researchers in the world, Dr. Tom Seeley from Cornell, um, who wrote Honey Bee Democracy and studies all these dances, he worked with uh, a computer scientist and together they came up with an algorithm of how bees are able to uh, divide where, what, what food source the bees go to. And that algorithm is now used for web servers on how to direct web traffic most efficiently. Is there any other questions? You know, I don't see one in the chat, but I'm going to throw one out there too, because I, I do, you don't even want to see how many tabs I have in my book. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't, I won't really uh, drag this out for too much longer for everybody. But, you know, they also, the under this, another thing I thought was fascinating was the, the, dr the way that the drones mate with a queen. And so does, do the drones meet with other queens or do they mate with their own queen or is it just like one big like huge party yeah so uh it's a good question um bees are not from alabama so they they mate with other queens otherwise they would be mating with their sisters and so what's interesting in in the bee behavior is that so where bees mate is in these areas called drone congregation areas which are um these spaces that are 30 to 50 feet in the air um, and what's interesting about them is that they'll remain year over year in the same location, but there's no drones that survive year over year. So a big question is, well, how do the drones know where to go? Now, what, what they have found is that drones will go to the nearest drone congregation area um, that's to the hive, but a virgin queen that's looking to mate, she'll fly up to nine miles away. And that's specifically so that she, the, the chances of her mating with uh, a drone that she's related to goes down significantly if they're staying close and she's going far. And um, what's interesting about the bees mating, so the virgin queen, when she goes to these drone congregation areas, which are kind of like bee single bars, and then so you have all these drone bees flying back and forth, you know, so think of a bar and there's, you know, 500 guys looking for, for one, for one female, it's a similar thing. And that, but when the, the queen bee is up there, she will actually mate with up to 24 different drones in that flight. And then she'll have enough reproductive material to last her lifetime. The drones after they mate that they actually, um, their reproductive organ snaps off and they fall to their death, but they do, they do look up and smile and give a thumbs up. What else you got for me, Larissa? Okay, okay. Here's one last one, one last one. So when I was looking at the pictures of the uh, the Langs, Langstroth hive, it looks like the super is not as deep as the boxes for the 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 the, the, the hive. Yep. Is that is it smaller so that you don't like wear them out, or why is that one smaller? Very good observation, and. Um, so the regular boxes we call deeps because they are deeper than the supers and the supers are smaller simply because of weight that, um, as I mentioned that bees for themselves need to make at least 80 pounds of honey for them, for them before I start taking it from me. So each frame of, of honey in, in the, in the deep frame can be 10 pounds. So the whole reason that the boxes are smaller that I take off, is simply that that box, um, a, a deep box could weigh up to a hundred pounds. And so by making it smaller, it reduces that overall weight. Now I still have had supers that weigh over 70 pounds and that's just honey that, that, that weighs that much. And what's amazing to think about that is that honeybees are storing all that in wax that they produce and their bodies make the wax that they're using. But think of like, think of like a candle, a birthday candle and how, how fragile that is. And then the bees are using that same sort of material, but they design it in such a way that it can hold, like I said, literally 10 pounds. It's fascinating. I see that there's someone has their hand up. I can't see, did, did somebody raise their hand? Yes, I did. Can you hear me? 
Oh, yes, yeah. now I can. You can hear me now. Okay. Um, I'm. Uh, there's two questions on chat that are related. Bam wants to know what is a beginner way to start with bees without making a large commitment. And my question is, what type of ordinances and things do I have to prepare for for wherever I'm living in my municipality? Is there a state guideline, are there, or are there just local guidelines? Great. So both of these questions are related. So uh, we're very lucky that New Jersey at the state level has the beekeeping laws um, that uh, I want to say it was in 2016 that it got passed. Um, and uh, then it was given to the Department of Ag to set up the regulations that support the, um, the, the beekeeping legislation. And so if you Google in, uh, New Jersey, Department Agriculture Beekeeping, it'll take you to that page and there's a list of frequently asked questions. So the good thing about these laws is that you can have bees in any municipality in the state of New Jersey because state law supersedes municipal law. The, the second, but there are regulations you have to follow and that's what's on the Department of Ag website. Um, and one of those regulations is that within the first 12 months of keeping bees, you have to attend an intro to beekeeping class. Um, there are classes that are offered throughout the state. Um, the, there's a, the, local, the, the state beekeeping club is the New Jersey Beekeepers Association, and there's various branches that will offer those intro to beekeeping courses. Additionally, starting this fall, Cornell University will be offering an online intro course to beekeeping. So the way to jump in, if you will, to start beekeeping is I would recommend taking a class, not just because it's the, it's the law, but because that'll give you a better idea of what's involved. Um, and also too, you can, you can buy a beekeeping book. Like I know one in particular that could give you an idea what it's like to do. Um, and then, yeah, maybe through the, the local club, you can maybe find a beekeeper that could take you out. And sometimes like keep an eye on uh, Ridgewood Parks and Recreation's website because we're gonna be doing some more um, hive diving days, we call it, where you can uh, come over and uh, see what it's like in some of, some of my hives uh, here in Ridgewood. Thanks, Frank. Welcome. Well Is there any other questions in the chat or? Yeah, I don't see any more in the chat, but okay. One last question about, this is about Queens. How, it seems like there are just, horm I mean, how do you, how does the queen happen? Do, and how do they know when they need one? So this is good. And I have, I have show and tell for this. So this is good. Um, so the, 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 there's two times when a, a colony will make a um, will make a queen. So remember, I said the two ways that they communicate. One was the dance; the other is through the smell. So everything in the hive gives off a smell or pheromone, and from that is how the 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 bees are know. So part one of the smells is the babies, which we call brood. And so a queen bee is laying uh, up to two thousand eggs a day. And so by you know that, there should be a certain number of babies in the hive. So think about if you go over somebody's house that has one baby versus some, a nursery that has 12 babies, we can even smell if there's a lot more kids, right? So similar sort of thought here. And so at the end of a queen's life expectancy, which is two to four years, she will start slowing down on how many eggs she can lay. So before she runs completely out of steam, the workers decide, okay, we need a new queen. Uh, the other time is when a hive is very healthy and they want to swarm. And that's when it makes the news when you see a big ball of bees um, hanging from a sign or like a few years ago, I got a swarm that was outside of Raymond's in downtown hanging from a tree. And so what the workers bees do in both cases is that first the queen lays an egg, a fertilized egg in the honeycomb. And that egg would then either develop to be a worker bee or a queen bee. And then what happens is that the, the workers or nurse bees, what we call them, then when they're taking care of the babies, 
they feed that developing larvae different. They, get, they feed it royal jelly, which you may have heard of. And royal jelly is actually the equivalent of bee milk, and it's secreted from a gland in a bee's head. So they feed that bee differently, and then they also draw out more wax. So a mat, I'm going to show you this. So if you can see this, that's normal honeycomb, right? And so in each one of those cells, we call it, is where the queen would lay an egg. Now, if it was going to be a worker bee, then it would just develop in there, and then they would cap it. And what that means is that um, bees are kind of like butterflies, that instead of a caterpillar, they start off as a larvae, but they do build mini cocoons inside of there, and then they metamorphose from a larvae into an adult bee. So that's why you never see any tiny baby bees flying around. So, But if they want to make a queen, they extend that cell, and they actually build and it looks like that, that's an actual, it's called a queen cell and see how it kind of looks like a peanut and that it actually has the texture of a peanut in a shell. And so by building that out with more wax and giving that larvae more room to grow in different food, then that larvae will develop into a queen bee as opposed to a worker bee. And the, the differences between those two types of bees are fascinating because a worker bee's life expectancy is six weeks, a queen is two to four years, a worker bee has a barb stinger. A queen bee has a straight stinger. Um, a, a queen bee also has a fully um, functional reproductive system. And the worker bee has like those glands I told you, the worker bee has that and the queen bee doesn't. Um, so it's almost at a genetic level, almost a different type of insect. And that's all by food and space. And so what happens is that the queen bee, what after uh, 16 days that she will hatch out of this and then um, worker bees will build multiple ones of those in the hive. And so the first thing that the queen does when she comes out is she finds the other ones of those and she uses her straight stinger to stab them so that she can be the ruler of that colony. And then, but if two happen to hatch at the same time, then they'll actually have a, a fight to the death with one winning and taking over and the other not. And um, what's interesting is when they fight that they'll actually make this sound called piping and you can hear it with human ears and it kind of sounds like and what that is, is that the queen bees are doing that to call each other, say like, Hey, I'm over here. Well, I'm over here. Let's do this. Let's get this on. They're smack talking each other so they can find each other to fight. And um, I had told some kids at Ridge school, actually that story and they're like, oh, why are bees so mean? And um, what I, my, my response to that was that it's not that bees are mean. It's that imagine if our bodies could grow new hearts when ours started to get old, and, but it would grow several ones and the strongest one would win. Well, we would want that strongest heart to win as fast as it could and, and, and get rid of the ones that aren't as strong. So it's the same thing with a queen in a colony of bees. How was that for a very long answer? <laughs> Thank you so much. There's just, I don't know. I you, you, There's so many more details. Like you answer one thing and then it raises so many other just really wonderful and fascinating possibilities. I can really understand how beekeeping has become your, uh, your life. I can really, it just, it really does make sense. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's what I love about it is that there's two sides to it. I always say that there's, there's the practical side gets me off the couch and outside and I'm actually doing something. But then there's also the nerd side of beekeeping and there's all these facts. And, you know, honeybees are one of the most studied creatures on the planet. So there's always new journal articles that are coming out all the time about different studies. And so it really is intellectually stimulating as well. And that's why in my book, I have these, I call them bee nerd alerts that are little boxes that go into a little bit more details about some of the different things that we're talking about. Did I see somebody had their hand up again? No. I think we might have a couple other, um, I did, I might've missed it that went, uh, what is some small way to get started with bees before making a big commitment? Yep, I got that one. Yeah, I, I must've missed that one. And, 
but uh, thank you so much. And you know, this and this book um, was really so fascinating on a couple of levels. Not, not just the beekeeping and or about bees, and it also really, really made me made me uh, realize that I love the idea of beekeeping, but I could never be a beekeeper because I can appreciate what the responsibility is. But I love that how you talked about how you um, became a beekeeper and that um, it was really interesting to read about how you found um, your passion and how um, even if beekeeping is not your passion, just how people can get that from the book that uh, to keep trying and you really you really did keep trying to find that and it was really wonderful that you found this yeah thank you and that that's what like if, if there's you know something i hope that people get from the book is that i think inside of all of us that there's something that we've always wanted to try or do and and you know it, it took me till i was older before i actually stepped into my passion so if you know as people are reading this i hope if there's things that they haven't done that this gives them uh, the empowerment that they need to, to try it and do what their heart tells them that they should be doing as well. But um, I would like to again, thank the, the Ridgewood library and uh, bookends for, for making this event possible. And, and I would, as I said, encourage everyone to, to please stop by bookends um, by supporting them, you're supporting the community and you're supporting the library so they can continue to put on events like this. So um, thanks to all for showing up and thank you library and thank you bookends for all your support. And thank you so much, Frank also. And you can also borrow uh, the book from the library. And uh, Frank just told me uh, on Saturday that there is an audiobook version. So we'll be sure to add that to our collection soon too. Thank you so much, Frank. Well, thank you and everyone have a great night.